What I'm going to be talking about this morning is about these existential approaches to therapy. And a lot of therapies uh, work with people in terms of their problems and have ideas about, say, dysfunctional cognition or Freudian approaches. We talk about different parts of the psyche, like the id and the superego. What existential approaches try and do is to really go back to the question of what is this existence and what is our existence about? Um, what is really core to our existence? And, and if you look at a lot of the psychological models, although you know, they can be incredibly helpful, that often they don't start with these questions of what is it that as people really matter to us? And the existential approaches try and go back, try and ask those questions and try and understand people in terms of those meanings, in terms of those values, in terms of those uh, relationships. So in the, in the therapy world, we have a kind of lots of different models and lots of different approaches. The existential approach is one approach, the cognitive behavioral approach, psychodynamic approach, all these different approaches. And what you sometimes get in the therapy world is you kind of get battles between the different therapies, one saying that they're better than the other and more effective than the other, or, or, or one's more useful than the other. And what, one of the things that was involved here, and you'll see how it comes out of an existential, it kind of comes out of existential ideas, but also forms a framework for existential ideas, is this idea of pluralism. And pluralism is the idea that we really need to value all the different therapies, that, that it's crazy having these arguments about what is, which is the best therapy. I'm going to talk about existential therapy, but, but from the standpoint, really, that it's not the best therapy, but that it's one therapy that can be helpful amongst many others. But a good way of thinking about the existential therapies is that they're based on the ideas and the philosophy of existential philosophers which was a philosophical movement around the kind of, had a peak around the kind of middle of the 20th, 19th century and again in the, in the 30s and 40s in the 20th uh, century. So if we want to understand existential therapies, the first thing that we need to do is to go back and understand what is existential philosophy. What is this kind of existential school of thought? Um, now, a lot of people think about existential philosophy as something which is kind of a little bit miserable, kind of a little bit morose. I like this cartoon, Existential Night Out. Tonight, Leonard Cohen sings the songs of Morrissey. Um, yeah, so it kind of has that um, kind of uh, the myth about existential being uh, a bit dark and a bit depressing. But and, and in some way, you know, I'd love to say actually that's not true at all. And it's kind of true and it kind of isn't because it, it, it's... It's a philosophy of trying to be real about what existence is like. So it does challenge kind of more optimistic, perhaps more uh, blue sky school of thought and really tries to get us back to this question of what is our existence? You know, existential philosophy is, is focused on this question of what is this thing that we have called existence? And existential philosophers, I mean, they've been diverse just like existential therapists, have tried to answer that question in different ways about what is this thing that is human existence. Just to say, in terms of what existential therapy looks like, if you were actually to see existential therapy, because we've done some research on it, and a lot of it is based on, as with all therapies, and probably there's a lot of shared agreement across a lot of therapies, a lot of it is based on kind of forming a relationship, a relational foundation, and a lot of it is also based on what's called phenomenology, uh, which was developed by somebody called Edmund Husserl, which is where you really focus in on how people are experiencing things. Existentialism and Heidegger's teacher was Husserl, who was a phenomenologist. And he emphasized this thing about let's focus on how people experience their world. So a lot of existential therapy in reality, particularly in the UK, you go, if you went to see an existential therapist, what they'd be doing is helping you think about, you know, you explore your problems, how do you experience it, say it was something with a partner, you know, it might be looking at, well, what happens with a partner? Tell me about a time when you had a big argument with your partner. What was going on for you when you were arguing with the partner? Um, what were you feeling? What were you experiencing? What values maybe are important for you? So it does things like, this is the I-thou relationship. And important things are like standing alongside the person, not objectifying the person, but standing next to them and saying, well, tell me about how that's experienced. The other is a subject and thinking about their freedom and listening to the whole of the person in terms of their emotion and being open to their otherness, being validating and relating to them as a whole and being in dialogue. So existential therapies tend to be very dialogic rather than a kind of more um, didactic approach about I know how you can fix things. Um, it's about 
Whereas the IET stance, the kind of objectified stance, is about looking in on the person as a patient, saying, what's their diagnosis? What's my formulation? How do I treat this person? The existential therapies are more this kind of phenomenological perspective of what would it be like to stand in that person's shoes? So if I was a therapist working with a person who's having a relationship problem, I wouldn't be thinking, okay, how do I classify this problem? Is it like this or like that? What I'd be thinking is, okay, let me imagine myself what it feels like for them as they're having that argument with their partner. And uh, how does it feel? And I might even feel it in my body as well, or allow myself to feel it in the, my body. Just that kind of crushing frustration as a person feels like they're kind of banging their head against this partner, trying to get them to understand. And then what I might do is I might reflect them back and I might say, you know, as you're talking about that, I just feel that kind of aching frustration as you talk about it, and the client might say, yeah, yeah, that, no, that's right. It's, it's just this awful feeling that I have. We might go on to explore it phenomenologically and look at that uh, experience of it and try and unpack. We talk in the existential therapy field about a lot about kind of unpacking, opening out that experiencing so that we can understand more about that experiencing. And as I say, the, the aim really is to help the person come to terms with and acknowledging that experience. Because maybe they've been saying, you know, they say to their friends, oh, he's a nice guy and he's, you know, he's understanding and it's a good relationship. And she's talking about how the relationship's working. But actually, when we explore the concrete reality, um, there's something very different going on. And coming back to that reality then might help us think about ways that we could fix it uh, or change it. It's about things like active listening, being empathic. As an existential therapist, putting to one side my own assumptions, working in a descriptive way. So rather than interpreting and psychodynamic approaches would be more about maybe I'd be thinking, well, I wonder if her relationship with a partner is something like it was with her father. What I'm trying to do rather is get a more and more rich description. We'll see some examples of this later. Being non-judgmental, using lots of open-ended questions. What was going on when you had that fight? Uh, what happened after it? Exploring also what goes on in the relationship. So what's it like being with me now? as a therapist, do you experience me? Do you experience any of that frustration with me? Do you feel that I understand as a way of understanding more of that world? Um, exploring using symbols, engaging in dialogue, and generally the aim of the existential therapies is to help clients unpack, deepen and un that understanding of their experience. But as I was saying though, in existential philosophy, so existential therapy works very phenomenologically in terms of this unpacking. But it also makes certain assumptions about what that experiencing is like. And this comes back to what I was saying about existential philosophy. It assumes that people have a sense of freedom. And it assumes also that that freedom is curtailed by limitations. And it assumes that people strive for meaning. And the existentialists talk about standing naked in the storm of life. Standing naked in the storm of life. That a good life is one where we really face we grasp our freedom, we, we face the limitations, we take hold of our meaning, and we, we, we live the most of that, this rare, precious opportunity of being that we have for such a short space of time between these kind of bookends of birth and death, that we have these kind of 75 odd years that we can really make the most of. And to do that, you know, we can't mess around kind of denying our choices, going along with everyone, because if we do, we don't feel good about ourselves if we just do what everybody else wants. Our defences, you know, we might think, well, everything's somebody else's fault, but then, of course, we don't get our, what we want, and then we have to blame others more, and we get into these kind of nasty relationships, we lose out, and essentially, we don't live the life that we want. So, existential therapists try and help clients acknowledge something about their freedom and choices, and, and you know, I was saying a lot of the existential therapies are fairly descriptive, and it kind of varies from quite a kind of tough, come on, face up to it, you need to stand up and face things to a softer, more gentle exploration. So what you're doing in existential therapies is kind of, you know, you're helping clients look at the choice, and sometimes also you're helping clients to act. You know, you're helping clients because, you know, many of the therapies are very reflective, and they're kind of looking at, um, you know, where clients do actually then think about choices and they want to do, that's great. Sometimes you also have to think, how am I going to help this client actually make a choice? You know, somebody's very, maybe started talking about a relationship, recognizing that they're choosing to stay in a relationship they actually don't want to be in, that they've got some choices and actually they could choose to leave, then what do they do about that? You know, and how can you as a therapist then actually help someone make a choice? Or rather to put that choice into action. And it's kind of like, you know, if you think about a diving board, 
You know, if you, you know, often the clients that we work with are standing at those kind of crossroads, paralyzed. They know which way they want to go, but actually going that way is difficult, like somebody standing at the top of a, a diving board. And how do you then help them move forward in the way they want? And that's one of the big challenges, I guess, for all therapists, is how do you support someone like that? You know, somebody standing at the top of the diving board, paralyzed with fear. You know, you don't just go and push them. Or maybe you do actually give them a big shove in the back, <laughs> is maybe what people let, metaphorically need. Maybe you talk to them. Maybe you help them explore what it would be like to come down, how they would feel if they don't make that choice. But often just being with someone, you know, and, and you know, being with somebody. Kind of think about people as moving forward towards things, towards kind of purposes. This idea that being is future orientated. Sartre says, man, first of all, is the being who hurls himself towards the future and who is conscious of imagining himself as being in the future. So although a lot of our psychological models understand people in terms of their past and what's caused people to be the way they are, the existential approach starts with the future. Heidegger, starts, Heidegger says everything begins with the future. We kind of think about where is it that people are going towards? What do people have in their heads about where they're going towards? And then kind of working with that and working with their understandings of purpose, directions. A lot of my work at the moment is around this concept of directions. Like where, where, where are people's directions towards? Where is it that we're going? And of course that's informed by our past, but it's really about our present, choosing towards to follow particular directions. And then the question becomes, are we moving in those directions? Are we moving in the directions we want to? Maybe it's growth people were talking about earlier or more learning. Or do we feel really stunted? Or do we actually feel that although we have directions that actually we're moving further away from the directions we want to go in? Or could it be that actually we don't have directions in our life, but we feel directionless? Um, and that a kind of well-lived life is one in which we have directions, we feel we're moving in those directions, there's a kind of flow towards the things that we want. Um, so from this standpoint, you know, if you think about how people are feeling and understanding clients and understanding yourselves, then it's not so much about what's happened in the past, but it's about your sense of what is to come. <clears throat> but not all existentialists think that there is a meaning. As I was saying, that for some existential therapists, there really isn't any meaning or grand design in the universe. Um, the, as I was saying with Heidegger, that we're interpretation all, all, all the way down. And we need to come to terms with our, you know, the fundamental meaninglessness of existence. So whereas some of the existential therapists would work with clients to find meaning and believe that there is an intrinsic meaning to find, other therapists would work more with clients to help them acknowledge perhaps that um, life is ultimately, uh, that there is no ultimate meaning uh, to existence. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you say to a client, well, you know, you might be feeling all right, but did you know your life is completely worthless? Why don't you just give up now? Um, but what it does mean is about kind of, you know, having clients where they do often ask those questions and being able to stay with that uh, and then help them think about what are the kind of meanings that they could create in their life. So, you know, but sometimes like being with clients and just staying with that meaninglessness can be uh, really important but not all the time. That comes going back to the pluralistic thing uh, that, that um, you know, different clients value and benefit different things.